seem to be lovely and sunny and 14 degrees. And that's the latest from the Canberra Newsroom. We'll leave you with Hobart's winter solstice swim, an annual tradition. Hundreds of hardy souls took a skinny dip in temperatures of just one degree out of the water and 11 degrees in. I'm Virginia Hausiger. Enjoy your evening. Good night. Welcome to 7.30. Tonight, should rich Australians have to pay for a public school education? It's just a duty of the Commonwealth Government to look after its young people. You know, they're, they're earning a lot of money, then I think that's a reasonable idea, but I, I wouldn't want to see it affecting low or middle income earners. Quick release. And Australia's newest sporting hero kicks the Matildas into the quarterfinals. And Australia take the lead over Brazil. There's a potential that this keeper might fumble the ball and I just knew that I had to be there to pick up any scraps. But first, even though the government recently launched a crackdown, young foreigners in Australia on working holiday visas are still being exploited and paid illegal rates. 7.30 has uncovered evidence that some are even told to put in fraudulent refugee claims. Many of them are employed by the companies that supply meat and chicken to Australia's biggest supermarkets. And as Matt Peacock reports, there are claims that the foreign workers' terms and conditions are being used as a precedent for local Australian employees. Amy Chang recently joined the growing army of international workers in Australia's food production industry. She soon realised that her working holiday was anything but. Many Asian workers here are being overworked, underpaid and exploited. Everyone thinks it's sick, it's very sick. Yeah, why we treat us not like a human, like maybe we're from the third world somewhere. Yeah, that's very sad. I don't want to cry now. Yeah. Amy got a job here at Wagga Wagga's Tees Cargill Meatworks. First salary you got is from the 16, 16. yeah, and the three months after, they get you 17. She was employed after registering online with Australia's largest private labour hire agency, AWX, which actively recruits overseas workers in Mandarin. It's a massive problem. Some 15,000 workers working in our industry right now, and there's around 100,000 workers that are working on 417 visa holders just from Taiwan alone. AWX provides staff for meatworks around the country that supply major supermarket chains like Coles and Woolworths. Amy paid AWX $300 to do a training course in Sydney, and that's when her concerns began. No one training us. It's just one boner. He's such very busy for his job. No one teach us. So we need to learn how to use the knife and we're very scared to hurt ourselves. For three weeks while supposedly being trained, she and her colleagues toiled here for up to 11 hours a day for no pay. No pay, no, no super. Not, 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 uh, not anything. Then she started work in Wagga at $17 an hour. Many AWX workers, like this one, too frightened to be identified, were given this form to sign, headed application to undertake voluntary overtime hours. 
Not voluntary. <laughs> Just like forced you to overtime work. You don't have a choice. Yeah, you cannot say no because no choice for you. You need to sign your name. Otherwise, you need to get home. You need to go back to your home. The AWX form says, I've been advised that this work constitutes voluntary overtime hours and as such is payable at the current ordinary rate of pay. Recent pay slips obtained by 7.30 confirm the practice. Normal, normal hours, 38 hours, 16.86. That is the minimum rate of pay for every worker in the meat industry. Overtime hours, 10 hours and 25 minutes, 16.86. That's illegal. You can't pay workers ordinary rates of pay for overtime. The union fears lower pay conditions will soon flow through to locally hired Australian workers too, who now also join AWX to get a job in Tees Cargill Meatworks around the country. This is the Brisbane headquarters of the labour hire company AWX and I've approached the company to see if somebody will answer questions about the rates of pay and the conditions, particularly for their foreign visa workers, but so far without success. AWX later told 7.30 its training programs are constantly monitored, that absolutely no one is forced to sign anything and everyone is paid according to our statutory requirements. At other meat working plants, conditions are even worse. Here at Beresfield, near Newcastle, Asian workers are exploited by a network of elusive Chinese-Australian labour hire agencies contracted by the giant Australian poultry producer Bayada. Secret camera footage has captured the reality inside the factory. A relentless pace. Workers processing up to 47 chickens a minute. Bayardas, Steggles and Lilydale chickens are sold in chains like Coles, Woolworths and Kentucky Fried. A Four Corners program last month triggered a Senate and two state inquiries, police raids and a government task force. Hands off the camera. Hands off the camera. Got to ask you to leave the site, mate. And, and shut the camera up. <laughs> but when 7.30 came here two weeks ago, little had changed. Backpackers are working 18 hours a day for $11 an hour and being housed by their agencies in crowded accommodation like this recently filmed carport for exorbitant rents. $100 per week. $100? That's a lot of rent. Yeah. To share a house? Yeah, in a room shared with other. Not very good place, not very dirty place. No hygiene, you can say, <laughs> um, because many people live together. Bayada denies exploiting its workers and its repeatedly declined interviews. Now, as well as illegal underpayments and tax evasion, an alarming new racket is being promoted by labour hire contractors who are charging workers thousands of dollars to apply for phony asylum visas. The agent just introduced that refugee visa to this more better. You got to write the work and you don't need to pay the student fees. 7.30s obtained copies of bogus refugee visa applications for Malaysian backpackers like this man. The plan is he'll appeal when it's declined, but continue to work in the meantime on a bridging visa for up to 18 months. He told me just go to the interview and just make some story. You know, that's bullshit that we didn't care, just, just want to postpone and get another bridging visa to renew the visa so that we can continue to go to work. You guys started work after... According to these Taiwanese workers, too frightened to identify themselves, the scams at Bayada's poultry plant continue. When did you start work? Last month. Last month? Mm -hmm. After the government set up the task force? Yes. Yes. And how much are you being paid an hour? 
Um, between twelve and fifteen dollars. Twelve and fifteen dollars an hour, which is less than half the union rates. Mm -hmm. Yes. How are you being paid? Are you being paid into your bank accounts? Um, by cash. Cash, cash in hand. Yes. No tax. No. No. Most Asian workers employed in these meat and poultry plants are too frightened to speak out publicly about their plight. But Amy Chang has decided that somebody must, even though it may cost her her job. In fact, I'm a little bit worried, but I must just say we just wanted something fair. It's just no more work right. Everyone wants to fight him with that, but everyone's scared to lose their job. But need something to someone to do that. So that's fine. I hope not got trouble after. Matt Peacock reporting. Afghanistan is in crisis tonight after the Taliban launched a coordinated attack on the country's parliament in the capital, Kabul, wounding at least 19 people. A suicide bomber drove into the building's entrance and gunmen attempted to storm the parliamentary compound. Afghani security forces killed seven of them. Joining us now from Kabul is Sadiq Sadiqi, Afghanistan's Interior Ministry spokesman. Thank you for your time, sir. What's going on in the parliament right now? Is this over? Yeah, it's over a long time ago, but um, the attack with this morning happened, lasted only one hour and a half, and the Afghan forces were able to, um, you know, repel that attack by killing all the uh, terrorists, seven of them. Unfortunately, no MPs were wounded in the attack. So the area is now completely secured. We have lots of security measures in place right now um, within Kabul city, uh, but the atta attack is over. Unfortunately, 19 of the Afghan civilians were wounded. None of them are critical, but they were taken to the hospitals by the Afghan police. What does this attack on the parliament mean for the functioning of government? Well, this place, uh, the parliament itself, has been always um, a target for the terrorists. We have had always intelligence report that the terrorists will attack the, this building. So today this was an attempt by the terrorists, but uh, as I said earlier, uh, the measures, um, security measures in that area were very strong and uh, that was the reason they were not able to get inside. Otherwise we would have been witnessed uh, a, a crisis here. But fortunately the response was very professional and the police were able to be there quickly and uh, uh, killing all of them were uh, yet a success uh, for the Afghan police force. Was there any significance to this happening today? Yes, there was a session, as usual, the parliament session, but, but this was special today because the um, candidate for the Afghan Defence Ministry was supposed to be there for a vote of uh, confidence by the parliament. So that was a particular session which was going on uh, today at the parliament. How is it possible that more than 13 years after the US and its allies launched a campaign to supposedly decimate the Taliban, the Taliban, the Taliban can strike at the heart of the Afghan government in this way? Well, unfortunately, uh, we still have our challenges, that's for sure. And Kabul has been always a target for the terrorists, so they try a lot. Although we fear lots of attacks, uh, you know, um, um, when the Taliban try to, to do some attacks, but there are ways, unfortunately, that they are still able to come to the city and launch attack. But beside this, our response today is very professional. We have this capability to deal with these kind of very um, difficult and, and, and complicated attacks and situations. So, um, you know, the response today showed that we are able to um, repel an attack in a shorter time and uh, control the damage that uh, this kind of attacks can, can bring to our society. Sadiq Sadiqi, thank you very much for making time to speak to us today. For years now, Australia has been grappling with the future of education funding and how to set schools up to better meet the needs of the children in their care. Today, there was a new twist, a debate about whether wealthy parents should pay for even public schooling. A reform like that would overturn the very foundation of education in Australia, that every person has universal access to free schooling. 
The idea is in a discussion paper circulated by the Prime Minister's own department, although Tony Abbott and his team have quickly distanced themselves from it. Political correspondent Sabra Lane. The federal government wanted to kickstart the week by talking tough on national security. Instead, it was on the back foot, confronting the fallout from a controversial idea to means test public education by making wealthy parents pay for their children to go to public schools. Victorians will not cop this. Free public education is just that. We're not having a situation where a person's parents' income determines the start they get in life. This is an appalling piece of public policy which Tony Abbott and Christopher Pine need to walk away from immediately. Liberal backbencher Andrew Lamming thinks the idea is worth exploring. Because ultimately the product has a value, the value should be reflected among those who have the ability to pay. And I think we already insist on the services charge for those going to university who are 18 years of age, yet some people refuse to have a similar fee imposed for those who are just a year younger at school. In Adelaide, the hometown of the Federal Education Minister, Christopher Pine, the idea to make wealthy parents pay got a mixed reception. I wouldn't want to see it affecting low or middle income earners. I think they should have a right to um, free education. That's a tricky one. <laughs> do you think if you can afford it, you should be paying more? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. I think that um, the education system that we offer is pretty phenomenal in Australia, so if we can uh, help those that need it, uh, I think we, we are in a position to do so. The idea was contained in a confidential report to inform state and territory leaders about options for reforming areas that both state and federal governments contribute to, including how government services are paid for. One chapter is about schools, childcare, early childhood education and vocational education. 7.30 has seen it. The chapter lists four choices for schools. The first to give states and territories responsibility for all school funding, with the federal government contributing nothing. The second gives the states and territories full responsibility for funding public schools, while the federal government funds non-government schools. The third option cuts the Commonwealth's involvement in managing school programs without any significant structural change. Pretty much it's the status quo. Or four, make the federal government the dominant funder of all schools. This chapter contains the hot potato idea of means testing, where each student would get a funding entitlement from the government based on their educational needs and their family's capacity to pay. And it would be used no matter which school they attended. Imagine two children sitting in a classroom. One who comes from a wealthier family, whose parents have paid for them to be there. One whose parents don't come from a wealthier family, who haven't. Potentially that's divisive because the parents who've paid money may feel that they have a greater entitlement to a better education. What we need is universal high quality education. Pete Goss heads the Grattan Institute's school education program. He thinks means testing is a side issue, not nearly as important as reforming the whole system. Clearly funding of education has been a major discussion for a number of years. It can be a political distraction. The countries that have the most successful education systems don't spend their time talking about funding. They tend to spend their time talking about how to improve classroom teaching so that every student gets a great education. The government says the options are just ideas. South Australia's Labor Premier agrees. His federal counterparts regard them as question time gold. Is this new schools tax designed to make up for the Abbott government's cuts to states and territories for public school funding? What extra damage will his secret and extreme plan do to Catholic schools. The Australian government does not and will not support a means test for public education, full stop. End of story. If the states and territories want to charge wealthy parents fees for public schools, that's a matter for them. 7.30 can reveal the paper canvases other controversial ideas, including a complete state and territory takeover of childcare and preschools. That's a big ask for the states. Given within two years, the Commonwealth's contribution will be worth $10 billion a year. The paper notes this idea would be a major departure from existing arrangements and would need to be carefully managed over a considerable period of time. It also proposes the flip side, a complete federal takeover of preschools, with money going to either the centres or families based on how many children are enrolled, their needs and 
the ability of their parents to pay. This reform talk comes as the federal government's yet to finalise what it's doing with higher education. In March, the Senate voted down the government's bill to uncap university fees. You have to get the reform bill through, otherwise the 1,700 positions would go. I'm a fixer. How did you fix it? I fixed it by funding it in another way, which you'll find out in the budget. 7.30 understands negotiations with the Senate crossbench, who are crucial if it's to pass, have stalled. But the Minister's office says the bill will be reintroduced in due course. Palmer United's D.O. Wong is one of eight Senate crossbenchers. He says the minister hasn't been in touch about it since Christmas and he's doubtful the bill will be revived. It was defeated last time. If they want to put it up again, I think that's a wrong move. They had, they had three months to look at the bill seriously and to think about what can they do to make it better. Yet there's no negotiation, there's no discussion. The self-proclaimed fixer there's an awful lot in education to work on. Sabra Lane reporting. 7.30 has a major break tonight regarding two of the most wanted Australians fighting for Islamic State in Iraq. With me now is 7.30 reporter Dylan Welsh, who's on top of the story. Dylan, what can you tell us? Well, what I can say is we know that uh, authorities believe that uh, Australia's two most infamous terrorists, Khaled Sharif and Mohammed El Amar, have been killed. Um, now, this is quite significant if it's happened. Um, I spoke to someone close to one of the families uh, just earlier, and my understanding is that they were killed in fighting in Mosul uh, in the last few days. Now, why, you say it's significant. Why is this significant? You know, just refresh our audience's memory as to exactly who these two guys are. Well, uh, I mean, Khalid Sharif particularly was the guy who went around the world with those now infamous photos holding severed heads um, in, in, in uh, Syria. Uh, the two of them have shown they have what's called reachback, significant reachback into the Australian community and have had the ability to uh, speak to young people and perhaps influence them to travel to Syria and Iraq. So I think authorities will probably be greeting this news with uh, quite a bit of relief. We will look forward to hopefully getting some more information from you tomorrow night. Dylan Welsh, thank you very much. Thanks. As we go to air, a day of crucial talks has begun in Brussels that could seal the fate of the European Union as it stands. At the heart of the discussion is Greece and whether it will stay or go. For five years, Greece has been kept on life support by emergency loans from the IMF and the Eurozone. But by the end of this month, if Greece can't repay about a billion dollars to the IMF, it could throw the European and the global economy into crisis mode. Our reporter Philip Williams is in Athens, where ordinary Greeks have bigger concerns about whether their country stays in the EU or not. For five long, painful years, the Greek people have seen the country they love, the security they took for granted, slip away. Now the young and inexperienced Prime Minister has begun what may be the most important day of his life. To try and convince the creditors there is another way. Nicholas Theoharakis is a close advisor to the Finance Minister and knows only too well the dangers today could bring. I hope that they do not, uh, in a sense, underestimate the resolve of our government, of our people, in achieving a deal, but also not accepting a deal that will be detrimental and catastrophic to our people. Despite what you say, mm -hmm. your creditors may not agree, your government may not agree to their demands, that leaves one conclusion, and that's a Grexit. You know, we will live and see, as we say in Greek. <laughs> It's the dreaded exam time at Athens University. For Associate Professor Aristides Hadzis, it's a bittersweet moment. Another crop of students is about to enter the real world, but the broken economy means their futures are uncertain and the institution they leave is chronically underfunded. We don't have enough people for the library to uh, stay open after four PM. So what, what, for example, around here, who does the cleaning? Actually, uh, we're paying for, from our own pockets. 
But there's a far greater threat to the nation's future. With few jobs and low pay, the best and brightest are leaving in alarming numbers. This is an unprecedented brain drain. A precedent. This is a national catastrophe. Some view working abroad as an opportunity, an adventure. But many would prefer to build their futures at home, like 21-year-old metallurgy student Mando Lazu. It's very depressing. Everybody has dreams, everybody, but uh, we don't see them to become a reality. Mando Lazu's parents ran a sports shoe shop, a thriving business until the crisis, which cut profits by 60%. But unlike many businesses, they have adjusted and survived. But with most of the stock imported, the risk of another major shock is almost too much to contemplate. Tell me what would happen to this business if there is a Greek exit from the Eurozone. Um, short term, there will be a complete catastrophe, but I don't know long term, but in the short term, disaster. But not everyone fears an exit from the Eurozone. Tourism is a mainstay of the Greek economy, and a return to the drachma could bring benefits for some. At least that's how hotelier John Consolas sees it. Well, I mean, automatically, uh, Greece will become a cheaper destination. That's the, that's the logic, anyway. Um, and assuming things uh, remain stable in the uh, country at large, in society at large, then we stand to gain uh, a, a increase, a, quite an increase in, in uh, incoming tourism as a result of the uh, cost parity. So in some respects, from your own self-interest, are you looking forward to Greece exiting the euro? Um, I wouldn't say I'm looking forward to it because there will be lots of, uh, there will be lots of fallouts, um, but it doesn't necessarily keep me awake at night. I think we can, we can handle it. I think Greeks are quite uh, resourceful. With unemployment already at 25%, 50% for the young, a dire situation could become even worse if the much debated Grexit or Greek exit from the Euro and the EU became a reality. According to Aristides Hadzis, basic needs for millions would be unaffordable. It will, it will be impossible for the people uh, of the lowest 20 to 30 percent of the population to buy these things. So this will lead to hunger, this will lead to people without access to heat or to, pharma, to, to pharmaceuticals. Extreme poverty is already a harsh reality for 59-year-old unemployed metal worker Apostolos Pitas. He has no income, no home and lives in the park next to the parliament. Our survival is at a tragic level, especially for the homeless people like myself, because we don't know what we are going to do every day, where we are going to find work and where we are going to find basic needs. He takes me through the park to show me where he sleeps every night. He's divorced and his two children can't support him. So this is home month after month. In the markets where many Greeks buy their basics, there have been changes too. Well, this market is obviously buzzing. It does hide a rather disturbing fact, and that is that since this crisis began, food consumption has actually dropped in this country quite substantially. And there's another feature of this and many other markets that's also a serious worry. As the vendors pack up and go, the discarded fruit and veg finds new customers, none of them able to pay. Whatever the politicians agree, it's not going to quickly change lives at the bottom of the Greek heap. And if they get it drastically wrong, there'll be many more scavenging just to survive. Philip Williams reporting from Athens. The Australian women's soccer team, the Matildas, have pulled off a surprise victory in the Women's World Cup in Canada to make it through to the quarterfinals. In the early hours of this morning, with just 10 minutes left in the game, they scored a goal and went on to win 1-0 against Brazil, one of the world's football powerhouses. Kaya Simon scored the winning goal and she joined me from Moncton, Canada after the team's triumph. Kaya Simon, congratulations on that stunning victory. Have your feet touched the ground yet? Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing achievement uh, by the girls and obviously super stoked uh, with the result. Um, having our families there to witness it as well uh, was definitely a memorable moment. But um, yeah, I think we're still um, a little bit speechless about, uh, about the result. 
Brazil is ranked higher than Australia and was probably the favourite going into the game. What was the mood like in the Matildas in the hours leading up to kick-off? It felt like any other game, to be honest. Uh, we've tried to keep that uh, relaxed mentality going into, into our matches and obviously knowing our opponents and respecting them, but at the same time not fearing them and, and knowing that we've got quality within our camp that we can get the results. Um, so that's, um, that's quite comforting and obviously having that belief that we can uh, win, win these games obviously plays a big part. Tell me about the moments leading up to your goal. Uh, well, it was a great ball through from Mini and obviously Lisa got on the end of it. Uh, I knew she was heading to goal and obviously having um, super wet conditions, it's a nightmare for keepers. So I just had in the back of my mind, uh, there's a potential that this keeper might fumble the ball and I just knew that I had to be there to pick up any scraps uh, given she dropped the ball and, and it just so happened to be that I was there and I could hit it in the back of the net. For 10 minutes after you scored until the whistle blew must have felt like a lifetime. It did. I think we just had to really focus as a group and, you know, really stay engaged in the game and, and not get a tour ahead of ourselves till we hear, hear that final whistle blow. And that was the message that we we're trying to get across to everyone the whole time was to stay in the game, stay focused. Uh, we hadn't won anything yet. And, you know, when that whistle blew, we just, um, we just really felt like we'd achieved something and, and could really, uh, you know, celebrate uh, with each other. Australia will face either Japan or the Netherlands in the quarter-final, depending who wins out of their game. Do the Matildas have a preference? I don't think we've really got a preference. When you're in the World Cup, uh, you can't really, I guess, have a preference. So it doesn't matter what our opposition is going to look like. I, I, I have faith in the girls that we've got the quality um, in our camp. And obviously, we have to uh, have a look at our opponents to see what their strengths and also their weaknesses are. This will be the third time that the Australian women have reached the quarterfinals of the World Cup. How do you rate the team's readiness to move up to the next level? Yeah, I have so much belief in this group. Uh, you know, when, when we started in January, I just knew that we had so much quality and so much raw talent. Uh, and we've really been able to mould that into such a strong, uh, unified group. And you can see that in our performances as well. So. I have full belief in the girls that um, no matter who the opponent is in the next game that we can really put out a solid performance um, and, and hopefully get the result. The team's had a very intense five month period leading up to the World Cup, training together and living together. What impact do you think that's had on the team's unity and performance? Um, it's definitely impacted the way that we've played as a team and um, you know, almost being in residency for, for six months has definitely moulded the team in, in a positive way and uh, you can really see that on the pitch. Today was your third goal of the tournament. You must be ecstatic with how the World Cup's going for you personally. Yeah, I mean, as a striker, you always want to uh, get some goals in the back of the net. But, uh, you know, my primary focus is, uh, is the team and, and us getting the results. And um, I'm just happy no matter if it's uh, me or if it's my teammates scoring the goals, I'm just happy we get the, the result we need. Well, the whole country is rooting for you. Good luck and thank you so much for making time to speak to us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. And make sure to tune in to SBS on Sunday morning to watch the Matildas quarterfinal game. That is the program for the moment. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. But for now, good night. Next, in a world obsessed with physical beauty, meet the man embracing ugly. Australian story. Then Four Corners and later Media Watch. Thursday. At 8 on the checkout, getting the spin on detox dieting and is there enough sugar in beer? Not enough. And at 8.30... It's the sound. I'd like to thank Albert. The story of how we got our rebellious sound. He was almost about to get what he wanted and it just fell over. The premiere of Blood and Thunder. Ted said, if they ever want to do something, send them to me. Followed by Dirty Laundry Live at 9.30, Thursday from 8 on ABC. This is Kate, she has been dead for over two years. 
How can that happen? From the makers of the slap. Don't let anybody see them. You should be safe here. From what? Everything and everyone. Comes a story of love, deception, and secrecy. Glitch starts Thursday, July 9, ABC.